to start our evening service. He lives, doesn't he? He really does. He lives. Let's look at the Lord. Father, we do thank you. We praise you, Lord. We truly look forward to what you have for us tonight, Lord. Uh, as we come together, we just are thankful. It's been a sweet day today. I know that uh, folks had opportunity just to uh, spend some time together, and uh, we are thankful for this holiday. We're thankful for just a, a real reminder of the of the importance of of fatherhood and uh, as we even tonight have opportunity to break bread together lord we see some important truth even in the study that we'll be in tonight how it applies really uh, to our savior in a very powerful way and so we pray your blessing upon tonight pray that you have your way with us each and every one of us and lord we just love you and we praise you and we thank you we pray all of this in jesus precious name amen and amen let's all be seated and again yes it is true we're going to be breaking bread tonight the way we do this uh, is we at the uh, conclusion of the preaching part of the service uh, that happens sometime tonight late tonight and you'll be you know we'll wake you up if we have to no just kidding but we'll uh, we give an invitation we believe in preaching for change around here amen we believe that that we ought to be able to respond to the preaching of the gospel and then we uh, would then have the opportunity yes to uh, to participate in the Lord's Supper. I, I want to say this because I know we have a lot of new folks with us. Uh, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, as I study the scripture, I find that what, what matters when it comes to the Lord's Supper is that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Amen? Somebody asked me one time, preacher, what happens if, uh, if somebody participates in the Lord's Supper uh, and they're not saved? Well, nothing. That's like someone who participates in baptism, the, the other ordinance of the church, uh, and they're not saved, that nothing has changed. Nothing's changed because it's about trusting Jesus. It's about being born again. And as born again Christians, we should not be ashamed uh, to step forward in baptism, amen? And we should not be ashamed uh, to recognize the importance of breaking bread together. So it really comes down to this. It's not going to matter to you if you're not born again. 
But I would ask you this question. If you are saved, and you've been saved for even a number of years, what hindereth you from being baptized? Amen? Uh, that's one of the reasons why we encourage people, you know. Uh, soon after uh, you trust Christ, uh, uh, do what the Bible implores you to do. Uh, get baptized. And I would even say today, if you're not saved, and before this service ends, you say yes to Jesus Christ, you trust him as your Savior, you want to, you want to begin to be obedient to the Lord uh, in baptism soon, but, and, but even the breaking of bread. So that's a quick uh, synopsis of what we believe the Lord's Supper is all about. Let's continue. I want to just share a few announcements, and we're going to continue with the service. Uh, notice um, uh, how, many, how many did notice that we had a great break bake sale this morning, amen? And I saw some of you participating in that greatly, okay? You know the first part of the Lord's Supper where it talks about indulging and doing all those things? I'm glad you got that out of the way this morning, amen? Uh, Faith Bible Institute. Don't forget, registration, Doctrine of Angels. That is our elective for this summer, and uh, really want to encourage you to be a part of that. Classes begin Monday, July 30th, and uh, August 6th. And so um, you uh, see Henry and Sheila, make sure you get uh, signed up for that. Uh, and also, don't forget the fall semester. Uh, we talked a little bit about Faith Bible Institute. Faith Bible Institute this morning, and we sure want you to be a part of this great ministry. And of course, we can use all the help we can get. We need uh, we need some more signatures. We need some more people committing to uh, our our summer uh, children's ministry. This is an opportunity for someone who might not be able to commit to the whole year of of teaching Sunday school or helping in in children's ministry, but they can help or teach. Um, for a week or two or whatever you might be able to do. See Pastor Ashley or Miss Betty, and uh, they'll get you all fixed up. All right, and of course, we all saw that amazing four-star performance by Anita this morning as we're reminded of VBS right around the corner, amen? And so be praying for VBS, and we'll be looking forward to getting started with them, amen? All right, let's continue with the service. Please stand once again as we turn to page 271 in your hymnals, Standing on the Promises. have our men come forward we're going to have our offering all 
All right. It's fun to watch it from my vantage point as these guys are getting all sorted out here. Amen. Amen. Preacher, missionary, Jaime Reyes, grab that mic right there and look to the Lord for us, would you, sir? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for the evening service. Lord, help each and every one of us this evening to give according to their hearts. Lord, mm. we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Boy, I should appreciate that offertory and, of course, the special and I'm sure I'm thankful for our musicians for sure. Amen. We have already mentioned this and I think it bears mentioning again, there is, there is no doubt that in this wonderful account of Joseph and his life and his relationship to his brothers, we truly see a picture of Christ. There's no doubt whatsoever. And it's amazing how 
as I prepared ahead, I began to pray, and I thought, this, this particular block of Scripture that we will be in tonight can truly be tied into the Lord's Supper. And we'll see all of this. It won't be hard to find. I'll tell you, we won't be reaching. We'll be finding right there on the bottom shelf exactly what the Lord has for us. But if you would, would you please turn tonight to Genesis 45. Genesis 45. And I'm going to break it down into just uh, three different blocks of Scripture. So we'll begin with the first five verses. And... I truly must tell you that your heart will be tugged at just, just to read the scripture tonight. I can say that for sure. Genesis 45, look with me, verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Father, we thank you, we praise you. And yes, there's no doubt there is so much to be learned from Joseph. But even tonight, I believe, Lord, you're going to help us to see how truly Joseph is a picture of our Savior and his relationship with his brethren, with his real Half brothers is very similar to, uh, in many ways, our relationship with you. And even as we have opportunity to break bread in just a little bit, let us recognize the importance of a memorable moment, a time like tonight where we will, yes, remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, but we're, we're also going to recognize the importance of of reconciliation, of making sure we're right with you. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Events vary as to the imprint they make in our minds. Joseph's revelation of himself to his brothers and their subsequent reconciliation with one another was... Doubtless memorable. This truly would have to be a memorable moment. Emotions often make indelible imprints. Joseph could, could not retain his tears nor hide his love. The brothers could not forget their guilt and their consequence, or, or rather their conscience, now came to the surface in an awful moment of truth. You know, it is indeed a, a memorable moment, there's no doubt. For Joseph, the moment was one of revelation and reconciliation. For the brothers, it was a, a moment of recollection and repentance. Such never occur without leaving some imprint. For you and I, we can remember memorable moments when the Lord would reveal sin in our life, speak to us about a important decision that he would have us make. And we can, of course, remember the time when we said yes to Jesus Christ, when we asked him into our heart to be our Savior. 
And I believe that for many of us over the years, breaking bread is a truly memorable moment. It's a time of circumspect. It's a time of, of examination. But it's a time to, to, to rejoice in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. It's a picture book, isn't it? You see, the moment was memorable because of discovery. History has filled events with discovery. The discovery of America. <laughs> Although it was accidental, it was still the discovery. The discovery of the North Pole, the moon. Each of these is a memorable moment. A scientist was once asked, what is the greatest discovery you have ever made? His reply was that I was a great sinner and Jesus Christ is a great Savior. May I tell you what man may find a great discovery? The Lord says the greatest discovery of all is himself. We see that Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. As we read just a moment ago, these first five verses... Uh, tell us what happens at this moment. For 15 years, they had been separated. I just want you to take that in for a moment. Some of you in this room weren't even alive 15 years ago. You know, time has a way of erasing the past. And uh, the longer we live on this planet, the more we appreciate this. Time has a way of erasing or at least covering up and hiding wickedness and guilt. How many of us have watched some of these documentaries where somebody is finally brought to justice after they committed a heinous crime some 35, 45, 50 years ago? And any sentence would be a life sentence then. Notice the, the sudden disclosure of Joseph. What this must have been. What a moment. I mean, this right away, immediately, these guys, these brothers went just totally flush. And, and uh, it brought recall. Suddenly it hit them. Oh, my. It's, it's him. Uh, the brothers remembered their wicked design toward their estranged brother. Well, you know, the old hair standing up on the back of your head, if you got any <laughs> feeling? Let's notice what we see taking place here. See Joseph's compassion. His emotional outburst of weeping was, was an evidence of this. It was, it was, it was our Lord Jesus who, who likewise wept tears of compassion over an estranged city, Jerusalem. It was a great moment in life when, when uh, it, it's a great moment for us when, when we're able to shed tears of compassion over those who have treated us wrongly and sought to do us harm. You see, it's not restoration and renewal if, if there's never been a separation. Have you ever been treated wrongly? Have you ever enjoyed the, 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 uh, the, the wonderful work that the Lord does when, when those who have been separated are restored? We see Joseph's initiative. He did not delegate the responsibility of making himself known to others. Uh, this is much like our Lord. Our Lord himself came personally to this earth to make himself known. You talk about the great reveal. Uh, we may learn as much from what Joseph did not say and do as from what he did. You see, Joseph, Joseph did not chide his brothers. If it would have been me, I'm telling you, I think I might have went on, on a war path. Uh, he didn't remind them of their evil deeds toward him. You know, the real truth is, people who do evil towards one another or towards someone, you don't have to remind them. All they got to see is your face. 
uh, he could have gotten revenge. I mean, he could have he could have forced his brothers to plead for mercy. I mean, he is the second most powerful man in all the world now. Uh, he could have displayed through the years a cynical spirit that 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 God does not seem to intervene when his people suffer. He could have been so tore down and beat up over this. And it, he could have been one of those bitter men that just have a bad outlook on life. I mean, he could have, he could have shown defiance. Uh, <laughs> love and compassion do not behave that way. It is indeed a great moment when a man takes the initiative to forgive. And I'm not talking about forgiving someone because they forgot to say hello. I see some people who can't get over that, you know. Well, they didn't shake my hand in the church service. Well, maybe you should unfold your arms a little bit and quit gritting your teeth. I don't know, you know. This idea that forgiveness is about, well, everybody better do right, and then I might consider it, is not biblical forgiveness. To forgive them is an act of real mercy, a, a, a desire to, to see restoration and renewal. I'm here to say our Savior loves us. Think about that, how much he loves us. And what he wants for us is reconciliation. Making sure that, that, we're, that we're drawing closer to him. Isn't it good to know that he is, he's not looking to try to make an example of us. He wants to bring us. He wants to draw us. See Joseph's forgiveness. How like the Lord Jesus was Joseph to, uh, to display this type of forgiveness in this grand moment. I mean, the, the innocent takes the initiative to love and forgive his enemies. And, I, and I, may I say this? There's not a one of us here tonight who hasn't been hurt at some time. And, and, and I think it would be fair to say, I can begin with the preacher, that not one of us can ever say that we're completely innocent of not causing pain or hurt for someone else. The brothers discover their sin. The discovery was new. That's true. Fifteen years late, but new. You see, no matter how old, are you ready? Your sins might be. When you recognize you have sinned before a holy God, it's time, it's time, isn't it, to get some important work done. It is always a memorable experience when a man comes face to face with his sins. Before he knows Christ as his Savior, he must recognize that he is a sinner in need of a mighty Savior and ask Jesus to be a Savior. But after we come to know Christ, you and I both know there are times when we need to examine our heart and confess sin, turn from that sin. For Isaiah, it was a moment of renewal. For Job, it was a moment of repentance. For the prodigal, it was a moment of restoration. I, I see all of this in the ordinance of the Lord's table. The goodness of God, <laughs> the goodness of God has a strange way of helping us remember the forgotten, uncover the hidden. And you know what? We must come face to face with that which we have ignored. I would even hope that even now we're already having and you got to be able to multitask and to do this because I know you're listening intensely to the preaching. 
But at the same time, the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart. And he's speaking to you about how important it is to do big business with him. Maybe it'll come outwardly uh, during the invitation as we have an opportunity to pray in an old-fashioned altar. Maybe it'll be right where you stand and, and you want to make sure that you do have an important conversation with the Lord. Notice with me secondly tonight, got to move here. The moment was memorable because of testimony. Look with me. Genesis 45, look with me, verse 6, and track with this, with this narrative. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father of Pharaoh and lord of all his house. And a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye and go up to my father. Say and say unto him, Thus saith the son of Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. You see, Joseph recalled the trials of his life. Imagine being there. Imagine being one of the brothers. He saw the pit in which he was thrown by his brothers. He remembered the years of slavery into which he was thrust by his brothers. Doubtless he reflected on on the diabolical scheme of Potiphar's wife. Uh, This resulted in his being cast into prison. As we have tracked through scripture, we see his ebb and flow of life. He may even have recounted that hour when he interpreted the butler's dream and, and thought that his hour of deliverance had come. Joseph could see the hand of God in all of these trials. Have you ever just stopped and, and gone back and think of how God has been there for you through the most difficult times of life? Oh my. When you break bread together... You you remember the death, burial, and resurrection of the Savior, but you're able to go back over the years and see how the Lord was so very present, working in such a mighty way. In Genesis 45, 5 through 9, Joseph used God's name four times when recounting for his brothers what God had done. You know, isn't that amazing? They were doing what they were doing. But really, Joseph could only see what God was doing. Each divine activity reflected the hand of God on behalf of his people. Joseph testified about how how the God of the covenant had brought good out of evil and shown himself mighty. How about us? When we go back and we see God's hand... We see often it's during some of the most difficult times in our life, right? When we see God in such a mighty way. Let's look back at our life and see what God has done. We don't have to worry about wrong decisions that man has made. We need to know that God is sovereign. He's on the throne. He's in control. As we look at our church family over just even the last few months and some of the the challenges that that you have met. I'll tell you what this preacher sees. We have a great God. We have a great God. Look what God has done. Joseph's testimony shows God's absolute control over all creatures and events. Amen? For God did not send me before you to to preserve life. 
the plots, the pits, the dungeon, all were the designs of humans. Humans are still very good at doing these kinds of things to themselves. But likewise, there is in the purpose, the plan of God. I don't always understand why certain things have to happen, but I do trust that my God is absolutely 100% sovereign. You see, Joseph's milestones about his, or millstones rather, about his neck had become the stepping stones on which he might walk the path of victory and success. For one man to see so much wrong, he saw way more right in the Lord. Joseph's testimony shows that while God may be slow in our mind, slow to our thinking, he is always sure. It is one thing to be aware of, of God's ways in history. It's quite another to wait patiently for his timing in real time in your life. I know we have talked about how it's wrong to, to be behind the Lord and it's wrong to get out in front of the Lord. Our desire is to walk with the Lord. Joseph's testimony makes us aware that the Bible ascribes the actions of people both to themselves and to God. God, the God of providence, is able to direct even the evils of men. And God's ultimate purpose will take place. That's another one that I can tell you for sure. As a pastor, I've had people come to me and, and their troubles are bigger than my life. can. My brain can even process. People ask me, well, how do you handle it? I don't. I give it to the Lord. <laughs> you won't be a pastor for very long if you think you're the fix-it man. He is. The pagan King Cyrus, according to Isaiah's prophecy, was God's servant as was the arrogant Nebuchadnezzar. God will work even in the wickedness and evil of man. Joseph's testimony shows that, that God's hand is always moving long before it is revealed. Boy, this really speaks to me. You see, this is, this is true in the incarnation and death of Jesus Christ. The whole Bible points to the birth, life, and death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for us, we all look back to this truth. Joseph's testimony helps us to see how God can triumph over evil and cause his plans to succeed. May I tell you, no matter what you might be going through right now, no matter what your station in life is, no matter what decisions you need to make, no matter what is troubling your heart and your spirit tonight, your great God, your God, has plans for you to succeed. Now, is this a health, wealth, and prosperity comment? No. I'm not talking about, uh, I mean, if the Lord chooses to make you financially super comfortable, we say amen, and we expect to see it in the offering plate. I'm just kidding. Actually, maybe not totally, but the real truth is, Aren't you, you know, this, I, I must say, we pointed this out a few weeks ago, but my heart is heavy over the number of people, I mean, celebrities who have everything, who are taking their lives. I'm just a simple-minded Christian who's able to say, I don't know how you're going to work this out, Lord, but I know you are. I am on the front row watching the Holy Spirit work. I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep on trusting you, Lord. And then finally, please notice with me, the moment was memorable because of the accomplishments. Let's look at the, the, the last five verses. Look with me. Verse 9 again. Haste ye, go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith the son of Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, 
and thou shalt be near unto me. Thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and kept them and, and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren walked with him. Truly, we see a picture of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Savior is all about restoration and renewal. He not only wants to love his brothers, but he wants to love his brother's children. He wants to bring them closer to him. It's all found here. These are the same motives and the same, if you will, Ways that the Lord is working and, and thinking towards us. I'm glad that we don't have a God of, of envy and hate. Amen? I'm 100% I'm, I'm adamant about this. God hates sin. But God loves to see restoration. And yes, if God were to do to us what we really deserve, we wouldn't even have the privilege of coming to know him as our savior. That's the real truth. Did you ever think about that? And tonight we have the opportunity to remember, yes, much of what David wanted to see happen in his brothers, he wanted to bring them under his arms and love them and protect them and, and bring them through the difficult time. It was a display of God's salvation. You truly see this in this story. Man cannot live by bread alone, neither can he live efficiently without it. The, the wisdom bestowed on Joseph enabled Joseph to be the role of the Savior in this story. There's no doubt. It, it affected a reconciliation after 15, is that that's three times. One, two, three. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. That's fifteen years of estrange, estrangement. The, the embracing, as I read through this, I've got to tell you, it touches my spirit. The embracing, the kissing, the, the tears are all eloquent testimonials that the family was coming back together. What joy and emotion swells within the heart when, when that which was lost is found. It proved, it proved that appearances often are deceptive. I mean, let's think back. Let's recall that blood-splattered coat that the brothers had brought to their father. Let's recognize these real events. Let's consider Jacob's conclusion. It was based on, on, a, on Jacob's conclusion based on appearance caused him to lament. Remember what he said? Joseph, Joseph is dead. But not so, Joseph was alive. How often we are, we are too victimized by appearances and uncertain evidences 
uh, that lead us to wrong conclusions. Let me tell you something. My Savior is very much alive. Your Savior is very much alive. That's why we don't, we don't only tell half the story. We don't stop and pause and stay at the death, the suffering. We serve a risen Savior, amen? And that's who we rejoice in today. May I just say that as we have opportunity to, to break bread together, you want to do some big business for the Lord. You want to take some time. And right now, during this invitation, I'm going to ask our, our musicians to come. We are going to have an invitation like we do every time we preach from this desk because we want you, maybe even for some of you, there's been a tugging at your heart to get back to focusing on the right things, the most important things, and really the most important one, the Savior. And let's be reminded that this is what the Lord wants for our families, uh, to draw closer together in Him. And as we break bread in just a moment, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you take that time that needs to be taken to, to just let the Lord just speak to your spirit and stir your heart. And you know, I can tell you, I, I have been a preacher for quite a while, and I can say I have seen God work mightily, do special work in the hearts of, of men and women, family, uh, during the Lord's Supper. So let's just let the Holy Spirit have his way. Father, we love you. We thank you. And even now, Lord, as we have opportunity uh, to respond to the preaching of your word, let's make this our memorable moment. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.